All right. Thank you, everybody, for allowing me a few minutes of your time this morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you're at. Um, I promise I'll only take about uh, two or four minutes. Uh, first off, I would just like to thank uh, the people at the Pearl Foundation, some of the people you've already been listening to this morning, uh, for, for making this conference still happen. Uh, we were really excited at cPanel last year to hear that we'd be doing the Pearl Conference in Houston, which is uh, cPanel's hometown. We were really excited to get to show you guys our city, show you some of the things that we love about it. Uh, and like many of you, we were really disappointed that uh, kind of the situation in the world has prevented us from getting together physically. But the effort uh, put in to still make this event happen is nothing short of monumental. Uh, and is quite inspiring, honestly, and is really a testament to this community and how strong it is. So as you go through your week, uh, maybe even in the, in the next coming weeks, uh, I encourage you to reach out to the people on the Pearl Foundation and let them know that you care, let them know that you appreciate the work that they do. Um, and the uh, same thing for the speakers. Uh, one thing that if you haven't done a conference talk, you, you may not totally grok is that a lot of doing a talk is, is kind of this engagement with the audience and, and really feeling this energy. That energy is gonna be so much harder to really feel and appreciate. So take the time to, to hit up the, the, the reviews and get that feedback and also just kind of shoot people a note and tell them that you appreciate what they're doing. Um, so a little bit about cPanel. Uh, cPanel is uh, the web hosting platform of choice. We're a web hosting automation control panel um, based in Houston, Texas, but we have people kind of spread out here and there. Um, and uh, we are hiring. Um, so if you are on the hunt for a job, looking for a new challenge, looking for something to do, uh, please feel free to reach out to anybody you see at the conference uh, who works for cPanel, start a conversation. You can also find a full listing of our job openings at jobs.cpanel.net. Um, and yeah, we, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to see what opportunities exist out there. So uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to uh, introduce our first keynote speaker. Um, this is a person that you probably uh, most know for being the current pump king for Perl, uh, maybe even a maintainer contributor to a number of different projects such as Dancer, Dancer 2, Refutil, Module Starter, and a variety of others. Uh, maybe less commonly known is he is an uh, avid creator, uh, a musician, multiple instruments, a uh, very creative person, even uh, an avid crocheter, uh, and probably most importantly, uh, the owner of the Mohawk at the center of the Pearl universe. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Sawyer X. Really, we tested this. Right, so I thought it would just be uh, the best experience I could do by just uh, actually failing on uh, turning on the microphone. So um, thank you very much, uh, Phil, thank you a lot. Um, I wanna thank the organizers as well. I wanna thank the sponsors. Um, I'm really happy to do this conference. I'm really happy to be here. It's really, I think, a unique experience I'm gonna, I'm gonna remember. And I'm, I hope to have a really good time. Uh, and I'm happy that it happened in a time zone that uh, I could enjoy it from a completely different continent. So it's great. Um, I also wanna, uh, just before I start, thank everyone who is attending. Um, it's not uh, trivial and uh, it's really great. I'm gonna imagine that I see people even though I'm not gonna see anyone. So that's going to be interesting. OK, so um, I'm going to do a screen share for the entire desktop, see if that works. And this is going to be my talk. Uh, hope you enjoy it. Um, I am not going to be uh, taking any questions throughout this entire thing unless I have a bit of time at the end. Uh, also, uh, Todd has my uh, has my number, so in case there's anything urgent, that's the only way I'm going to know about it. So I'm not looking at any chat or anything else. Uh, since I can't hear anything, I imagine that you hear me speaking, uh, and if not, Todd will let me know. So uh, before I start, I probably should mention a little bit about me, uh, just for people who don't know uh, who I am and why I'm here to talk about it. I, I shouldn't have had this slide because I had Phil, which is... That was, that was really nice. Um, I, I'm still going to keep it, though, because I can't remove it now. It's too late. So uh, first of all, uh, Sawyer X, I'm, my day job is I'm a, a principal developer. I'm the Perl project lead, which is what we call the pumpkin. It's just a, a name that we use. And then I, I did work on, and I still do, on various Perl modules and frameworks. I tend to be a very loud speaker, and for this, I apologize in advance. I'm probably going to yell. You're probably going to see a lot of hands. It's going to be... 
uh, very awkward, and and uh, I, I would I would keep my hand on the uh, volume controls just in case. Before we begin, though, um, I want to say a few words about a friend that we we lost this uh, February. Uh, Jeff Goff has been a, a community member for a very long time in the Raku community, in the pro community. This picture was taken in February. Um, just a few days before at FOSDEM, where Jeff helped with the booth, as he always does. Um, I want to say that if you didn't have the, the pleasure of knowing Jeff, um, then at the very least, you're not going to have to feel this, this void that now we feel uh, with Jeff being gone. So this talk is going to be in three main parts. Part one is going to be about Pro 532. I always talk about the latest version, and just just Saturday, like just Saturday, we released a new version. So it's got some enhancement, optimization. You know, I'm going to talk about some of the stuff that we did there. Part two is going to be a story of priorities, and I think it's very important to talk about priorities in order to understand the last step, which is really the plan that we have set up for Pearl. Now, I do uh, want to warn you that the plan is. Uh, quite bold. So take a seat, uh, take a deep breath. I suggest uh, maybe a drink. It could be uh, water. It could be tea. It could be coffee. It could be something stronger. I'm going to let you decide which. But I suggest having one ready. Now, let's start with 532. First, who made it? A lot of people worked on 532. Roughly 90 people, maybe a bit more. Um, some of them in this uh, conference, I'm actually wearing a shirt that one of them made, which is of the uh, Pearlmongers. So thank you, Brian. And I'm actually going to name drop some of these people because I think it is important that you know of some of the people who work on it. So first, one big thing that we did, we moved to GitHub the, for ticket handling. We used to use RT since forever, but uh, there's a lot of maintenance overhead and our system administrators have to deal with a lot of mess. Moving to GitHub allowed us to control that. It allows us to work with authenticated users, so the spam went down to zero. It's a major change. Additionally, one of the nice things that we got from this is that we're able to get a lot of drive-by drive -by contributions. We're able to review things more quickly. We're able to merge things more quickly. We have continuous integration to do a bunch of testing. It's really, really nice. I want to give a, a, a big thank you to two people who worked on it a lot. And that's uh, Todd, who was just speaking, Todd Bernardo, and uh, Nicolas Rochelle-Manier, which I hope I pronounce it correctly, I was practicing. If you would like to look at Pearl, if you would like to contribute, you can just go to GitHub Pearl, Pearl 5, you'll find us there. So what else did we do? We also introduced the ISA operator. The ISA operator allows you to do the ISA check between an object and a package. This was done by Paul Evans. Leonard, thank you for doing this. We also have chained comparisons. This was done by Zephyr. So now you can compare multiple variables at the same time. It's really nice. And of course, Unicode 13 is now supported. Thank you to Carl Williamson. So the Unicode, um, every version that we get, we get new things. And every version of Unicode, what we get is new scripts, corrections, improvements, new characters. But the thing that most people remember is emojis. So we actually do get all of these new emojis. And I try to highlight every year the one or two emojis that I really liked. Um, I have ignored the whiskey emoji in the past because it is not relevant to me. But I did share the avocado emoji, which, you know, avocados are very relevant to me. So in this case, I thought it would be very important to share one that is a combination of multiple other emojis. Now, pro. Uh, allows you to just use uh, backslash uppercase N and then give whatever Unicode characters you want to use. And it's very interesting. We could use something called the zero width joiner. And in Unicode, you can combine two things with the zero width joiner in the middle and then create a new thing as long as it's supported by Unicode. So they've added the ability to combine these two things. And this is what this code shows. If we take a white flag and we combine it using the zero width joiner, to something, that's the technical term of it, male with stroke and male with female sign. Don't know if you know what that one is, but combining them together, 
what you actually get is the trans flag, which I think is very appropriate in this uh, uh, difficult times to a lot of communities. So uh, I'm very happy with this. I think it's really, really cool that we can finally do this as a, a Unicode uh, character. It's really awesome. We also introduced no indirect. So this is a pragma that allows you to remove indirect syntax. I'm gonna cover indirect syntax a little bit later. So I hope this will help. Also, we've optimized the common sort. Um, I believe this was uh, Zinu and I, I, Thomas, I can't pronounce the name correctly. I really apologize. Uh, the common sort is now noticeably faster. Some benchmarks showed it at about 5%, which is very useful because we use sort a lot. So if you do A to B, B to A, this is now much faster. Now, I always have one bug that we closed one way or the other that is my favorite for this release. This one is my favorite because it is also the oldest known open bug that we still have. This was GitHub 339 or RT1170. And if you know a little bit about the, the, the ticket numbers that we have in RT, this is really old. Like this is really, really old. How old? It was reported in 1999. It also has my favorite comment on a ticket that someone wrote, which was, <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I won't be able to pull off the, the accent. So I'm just gonna let you read it and enjoy it. GitHub is great. Um, okay. So there are a few also changes that we've done, things that happened that I want to give some credit to and share. It didn't apply to any of the categories above, so I'm gonna put them here. First, um, we have uh, open, the function open. If you call perl.f open, you get the documentation from perlfunk. And the documentation for the open keyword had been overhauled by Jason McIntosh. This was done as part of a TPF grant. This is part of the work that happens when you donate to the Pearl Foundation. So please do consider donating to the Pearl Foundation. And what Jason did was completely overhaul the documentation to provide a modern documentation. Open specifically was something that I complained about a lot is a good example of how difficult good documentation can be. But what Jason did was move all of the edge cases to the bottom. He documented very clearly. All of the code is really nice code that you want to copy paste because it's just done well and it's very clear. And it's just something you'd be proud of people using. It's written in simple terms. You can understand it. The technical is, is pushed to where it's relevant. Very, very, very nice work. And I think it's, uh, I, I was very impressed with it. I'm really happy we have this. The Lexer was significantly refactored by Aaron Crane, who basically tore apart the Lexer and cleaned it up uh, to different sections. So it's much more uh, fathomable. The Lexer is a very big part of the Perl interpreter and it, it had always been difficult to fathom, but now it is much easier to work with. So thank you, Aaron. We also have a new security lead. So security is one of those teams that uh, Perl has that doesn't receive much attention, especially when things go well. But I think it's so important that it's, we should be talking about it. So we now have a new security lead and that's JD. JD has been doing excellent work. He was able to close all of our outstanding security tickets and he'd been able to get us on the, on the path for understanding how to do better releases, faster releases, um, more, more secure releases and a lot of these things. Part of what JD has to do as a security lead, just big FYI, uh, he has to determine whether something is a vulnerability. So it needs to be classified. It does that with the rest of the security team. A CV has to be uh, done, uh, usually, usually done by Tony because he's willing. Tony Cook wrote the no indirect as well. Um, JD has to make sure that we talk to the people who open the tickets, that we keep them in touch, that we talk to distributors, to vendors, that we determine whether something has to be uh, disclosed and what is the disclosure date and how do we release that with the information ahead of time and coordinate everything. And there's just so much to do. And uh, JD is on top of it. And I'm, I'm, I couldn't be happier with JD joining the team. And um, thank you very much. We also added uh, on the security team, we also added Jim Keen into the security team. If you're familiar with Jim's work, he has been all over the ticket. I, I would call him the ticket master for Pearl. Um, or at least the, the, I don't know, title for uh, 
a ticket wrangler. But Jim is kind of aware of everything that's going on across Pearl. And in this sense, uh, it's vital for Jim to also have some insight into what's going on in security because it affects things outside security. Now, having gone over everything that went in 532, what I want to do is go over priorities. And priorities are very important. Um, if we understand our priorities, we will understand where we're going in the future of Pearl. Now, to talk about priorities, we're at a conference, so I think it's really a, a good example to talk about conferences. And that would be an example of how to prioritize things. And I think uh, if you've ever been a conference organizer, you're familiar with this, but if you haven't, try to imagine yourself as a conference organizer when I'm talking about this. So I'm going to describe three people, Caleb, who is a considerate conference attendee, I'm going to describe Patrick, who is a problematic conference attendee, and Nia, who is a newcomer conference attendee. These are not named after anyone specific. There are probably people named uh, uh, Patrick, Caleb, and Nia who go to conferences. There are probably problematic people named Patrick in general, but I'm not. This is not based on anyone in particular. And uh, through these uh, stories, I'd like to talk about prioritization. Patrick being problematic could be uh, the way that he behaves with others. It could be the way that he acts. It could be the way the kind of talks that he gives or how he behaves during talks, during uh, hallways, etc. You can have your own uh, definition of problematic, but I'm sure we will all agree that we have very clear ideas of what problematic means. Nia is a newcomer. She wants to enjoy the conference and Caleb is basically familiar with Patrick, but also wants to make sure Nia has a good time. So he tries to kind of run interference. And a lot of conferences, they have these kinds of people, like these three broad categories. Now, if we're talking about the success of the conference, the, there are a lot of ways to measure whether it's successful or not. To me, there is one big definition of success, and that is whether the conference ended up being a home to the people who come to the conference. You could validate it in a lot of ways, but to me, just the fact that you feel like this is a, this is your community, this is where you go. It doesn't matter if you have been programming in Perl for a very long time. It doesn't matter if you are new to this. It doesn't matter if you use Perl or you program in a different language. It doesn't matter if you're not even a developer. This is not the critical part. It is that you feel comfortable and you feel like this is your home. This is your family. These are your friends and your peers. And there are three measures to it. One is that uh, it is inclusive. It needs to be welcoming. It needs to be accepting of others. But other than just being inclusive and welcoming, it also needs to be diverse, which is to be composed of other people as well, not just to allow these people to join, but to be made out of all of these people. And lastly, it needs to be supportive, which means we have to be helpful, we have to be uplifting towards each other. But if you have all these three, you're likely to generate a home no matter who the people are. Now, let's go back to our three people. So when a conference doesn't have any standards for how to behave, how to act, when there's no way to enforce anything, when there's no way to control in any way the behavior of others or monitor it or, or address it at the very least, I think that's the most accurate uh, definition I could give it, the balance is kind of weird. So let's take a look at the situation. With Patrick being a very problematic person, for a conference organizer and a conference attendee, it is a high investment. You have to avoid Patrick. You have to manage Patrick. You have to work around him. You have to ignore him. This is very annoying. It's a lot of investment. But the newcomers and the considerate attendees, they're a low investment. We don't have to put effort. They have to put effort and we have to put effort with Patrick. Now on the other side of this, Patrick doesn't actually contribute much. He diminishes the inclusivity that we have, the diversity, the community, and this is a real problem. Also, for a lot of these people, I think uh, Patrick's um, understanding is that his contribution is that he's been at the conference a long time. But with a lot of these cases, and it isn't necessarily pro conference, it's any kind of conference, not even a technical one, what we see is that a lot of these people diminish the inclusivity over time. So the longer they're at the conference and the the worst job we do at managing them, the more they reduce the amount of people who will join the conference or feel confident and comfortable at the conference. 
but Caleb and Nia do increase inclusivity because new people show up. So there's a really weird balance here. We're putting a lot of investment on people who diminish. We're not putting investment on people who increase. If I were to do a cost benefit analysis, this picture would be kind of grim. The effort from a problematic person is very low. They don't have to put any effort. They're just themselves obnoxious, inappropriate, uncomfortable, offensive. But the community gain is also very low from these people. So that's, that's kind of weird. And then for considerate people, as well as for newcomers, they have to put a lot of effort, even though they bring a lot to the community. So they have to carry so much weight, even though they provide the most, and then people who provide the least have to put the least amount of weight, which is really weird because it creates the situation where problematic people have the best experience at the conference, and newcomers and considerate people have the worst experience at the conference, which is really bad in other, in other terms. So an analysis would be that we might cater to problematic people who harm us, instead of being open to well-behaved attendees. The conclusion is we need to prioritize toward people who help the conference and other attendees instead of those who harm them. Now, a code of conduct could be introduced because it can help create a conference that improves the community instead of diluting it. It helps enforce standards of behavior. If you have never really understood why code of conduct is important, why standards of behavior are important to conference organizers, this is why. It allows a conference organizer to change the priority to focus on newcomers, to focus on people who act well towards each other, to focus on considerate people, and then to address people who are problematic and spending less time addressing them. I don't need to convince a problematic person to behave better. I can just point to the code of conduct and say, there's a violation here and it needs to be addressed. And then I can work through it with them. But at the same time, it gives me a tool to, to address that problem other than running interference around it, which is very difficult to do. And it puts the weight on everyone else. All right. So we talked about this, this prioritization at a conference, but we, well, we're at a conference and we have the, now we have the TPF cat, which is really, really cool. And a, a great props to Stuart and the Pro Foundation for organizing this. I'm actually talking about language here. I'm not talking about the conference. So I should, yeah, I'm gonna switch back. So, okay, let's talk about users. Let's talk about language users. I have Marie, Marie is a maintainer. We have also Anna, who's an absentee. And we have Naveen, who's a novice. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about each one and then we're gonna explore the concept of prioritization just like we did with the, with the conference, but we're gonna explore this concept when it comes to programming language users specifically these three. So Anna is an absentee. She does not use Perl anymore. She did write Perl a long time ago, but no longer. Maybe Anna writes in a different language. Maybe Anna moved to Rust, but maybe Anna doesn't program anymore. Maybe she has a manager position. Maybe she has a director position. Maybe she doesn't work in tech at all anymore. So yeah, but see, but her projects might still exist. So. Well, some people use this, right? And the projects themselves at the same time don't really get a lot of attention because Anna's not there, she's absent. And the people who are using it are not really interested in giving these projects attention. So Anna's interest and the people who use Anna's projects, their interest is to have no change, absolutely no change, zero breakage to the code because as long as the code never changes, the, the language never changes along with code that never changes, everything stays the same as long as the environment stays exactly the same, which sometimes it doesn't. Now we have Marie. Marie is a maintainer. She does use Perl on a daily basis, probably. She gets to work with it, maybe writing her own code, maybe maintaining other people's code. And it could be within a company. It could be you know, just open source, free software. That's also good. But Marie as a maintainer is someone who is actively using Perl. Her interests are having new features or having new capabilities. Her interest in stability is kind of medium. You know, it, it shouldn't break all the time, but you know what? I'm there to fix it if it does. And of course, Naveen, who's a novice. Naveen is a beginner programmer, maybe not a beginner programmer, maybe a beginner programmer to Perl. 
and Naveen is looking for a new language, maybe the first, maybe the second, maybe the third. And what he look is looking at is something that is simple to learn, something that is useful. You know, it has to be able to use it for something, and that means that his interests are in a language that. Oh, I'm sorry. The slides move badly, right? So his uh, interests are in having, again, features, capabilities, ease of learning is very important. For Marie, she already knows the language, but Naveen doesn't know the language. So he wants something that is easy to learn. Also, he wants to be capable features. Notice that Naveen doesn't care too much about stability because he's writing new code. If something he just wrote broke, he could just rewrite it on the spot because he hasn't really written anything that's used already. Going back to definitions of success. We talked about conferences. Now we're talking about programming language. What is the definition of success for programming language? I'm sure there are a lot of definitions and we might have different definitions, but I'm gonna give the one that I think makes the most sense for every language. And that is usage. If the language is used, that means that it is successful. Now, some languages are written for specific domains. That's okay, but that means they have to be used within those domains. That means that it needs to be robust, features, tooling, flexibility. It needs to be fast. We always wanna execute more. We always wanna execute it faster. And of course, it needs to be reliable and people translate reliability as it never breaks. But what reliability means is that it predictably breaks. That when it breaks, I know when, how, why. Now, if we were talking about what a conference without standards looks like when it comes to balancing the concerns of the different users and the, the different people come to the conference. I want to try and balance the ones for Perl. So how does Perl balance between all of these people? Well, first, we put a lot of investment into old code. And we specifically, particularly, put effort in making sure that it won't ever need to change as much as possible. The goal is that if you wrote something, 20 years ago, it will continue your work. So we put a lot of investment. For Marie and Naveen, we put in much less investment. We're not producing too many big features because it really is difficult to add them to the language when we have to support all of the old stuff. We have to think of how that would look like with syntax that was written 27 years ago or a bug. We, we actually had to revert and introduce a bug because it changed someone's behavior and they expected it to stay the same. And this is not the first time, by the way, every year we have at least one major bug that we discuss for a very long time and that we return to the language, even though we can fix it. Because we optimize for Anna. And if Anna was relying on this bug, we're keeping the bug. Then if we're looking at what we get from, for usage, for what our goal really is, Naveen and Marie are writing code. They are writing new code, but Anna specifically, by definition, demands to not rewrite or change or update any of the code, which means that for Anna's code, it could only diminish. The usage could only go down. It could never go up because by definition, she isn't writing anything. That means that where we could lose the code and lose the usage, we put in all of our efforts to keep it. But, but in the area where people are trying to write new code, and to use language more, we're putting a bar there, making it harder. So that's the balance that we strike, which is, it is odd when you put in those terms. Let's do a cost benefit analysis. I'm sure the picture will look better or not. Okay, so what we have here is the absentee. The cost to the absentee is low. It's almost zero. The goal for them is to be absolutely zero because the idea is that the code will never get updated. The gain for us from them at the same time, it's very low. So that's kind of odd. And if we're looking at the maintainer, if we're looking at the novice, the cost of them is very high. They have to work around all of the code that was written for the absentee or at the time that the absentee wrote their code. And they have to make sure that they're not writing it, that they're aware of it, even though they shouldn't be writing it. They need to understand they might write code, that the language will think it's that thing instead and make sure the language doesn't get confused. When it gets confused, they have to deal with the error messages of that syntax. We can't have new features easily because we have to account for all that stuff so they're not getting what they want. It's really weird. 
And um, really, the, the best experience goes to the absentee. They do nothing. But they're not even interested in continuing to work on the language. But they get the best experience. And for the novice and the maintainer who provide us with a lot of gain and benefit, they get the worst possible experience. So I think we have a problem. This is what my talk is about. My analysis from this is that the people who contribute to uh, the least to the language are the most important citizens of it. Citizens of it. I think I had too much coffee. Okay, so I wanna put it in other words. The people who contribute the most to the language are paying for the technical debt of those who don't. And I'm gonna cover how they have to do it, just like I did before, but in more detail. And they have to do this forever. We never stop with this balanced act. There is no end to it. In simpler terms, we reward the citizens who hinder, we punish those who aid. And this does not seem to be, it doesn't seem, seem to me like the right balance, you know? So the conclusion is if the language wants to grow, the language needs to change priorities because we're prioritizing the wrong audience. Okay, so that, that begs the question, how do we change this? Well, let's keep this question in mind and move to the second part, the, the last part, the plan for Perl. So what are we gonna do? First, we need to change our priorities. We need to identify and understand our target audience and we need to help them more than people who are not our target audience. Now, I spoke about the cost that uh, Perl developers pay. I wanna go into more depth and give you some examples. First, I want you to think of any of these sentences and ask yourself, does this ring a bell for me? And if it does, that is actually technical cost, right? So that's, that's technical debt that you're dealing with. Well, let's try, try a few of those. So first, how do you start your code? If you have to think of how you start your code, then you're dealing with technical debt. If you need to start with like the stanza of you statements, you're trying to work out changing the baseline of someone else to a normalized baseline, uh, that's technical debt. Then there's how much of it is tribal knowledge. And what I mean is how much of this is information that is limited to a small group of people. And then you, if you're in the know, if you're in that group, then you have this cherished knowledge that you know why you need to do that. Have you ever done an eval on a version? Why would you do this? Well, it's tribal knowledge. If you ask the right people, they will tell you. And then of course, there's also cargo halting. There's a lot of stuff that we copy from each other. We don't necessarily know why. It is necessarily valuable, but we always copy those, which goes back to, we're hoping that this is tribal knowledge that is correct. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. There are a lot of awkward error messages that you get. I'm gonna give an example of this, but first I wanna explain why do you have awkward error messages? Awkward error messages happen because Perl supports a lot of types of syntax. It supports things that are really old. It support, supports things that are newer. Now, if you make a mistake and you didn't write the right syntax, then Perl tries to understand what it is that you wanted to write. If it happened to look like old syntax, it might think that this is what you were trying to write. And then if it gives you an error that you didn't write it correctly, the error that you're gonna get is for syntax that you didn't try to write instead of for your syntax. So the awkward, like the, the awkwardness here is because the error message doesn't relate at all to your code, only to what Perl thought it might be because it thought that you're writing syntax that you know you shouldn't. Maybe you don't even know that it's possible. In many cases, it's syntax you didn't even know was possible in Perl, but you get that error message. So take that into account, that's a cost. If you've had this before, and we all have that second call debt. And the quality of the tooling that you get, Perl bends over backwards to give you the best tooling possible. PPI works so hard. Now we have PPR works so hard. Perl Tidy works really, really hard. But at the end of the day, how much tooling do you have in IDs? How much of it is custom made? How many IDs have built in great tooling for Perl? It's just very different when you compare it to other languages. And that's because it's very hard to know what's going on because there are a lot of syntaxes. And lastly, overall, just how much effort do you spend to make things just behave? That is all technical debt. All right, so 
I want to give some examples of this. First, syntax validation. Now, there oftentimes we have this thing where someone wants to ask for help, they provide a piece of code, and then we look at it and we say, wait a minute, this isn't right. You're not starting with the right code. You're, you don't have use strict and use warnings. We can't help you until you add use strict and use warnings. If it's so fundamental that you can't get support for it unless you add it, why isn't this just part of the language? Well, in the old days, people wrote without strict and warnings. We should maintain it. That's why. I want to give you this example, which is one of my favorites, because I, I actually had to deal with this um, a little while ago. And this crops up every once in a while, especially when we have a large code base or we work with a lot of developers where not all of them are experts. You're going to have this situation. I'm going to ignore for a moment the fact that we're, I think, plus 30 years from when function signatures were introduced. And I still have to, by default, do a shift to get the value. I'm going to put this aside for now. And hopefully my uh, expressions <laughs> clarify how difficult it is for me to put this aside. Um, I'm going to focus on the second line there, the first. So I have an array of people. I run first, and I call it has item on each one. And I eventually store that. I get these errors, though. I have a use of an initialized value that's input, um, and I have can locate object method. Now, the first warning there, the initialized value, people has a value. I double checked, but input is still uninitialized, which is really weird. That doesn't make sense. The only case this could happen is people is an array with the value on def, but if it is an array with anything other than undef. If it's an empty array, this wouldn't even run because there are, there are no items in it. The second one is really the problem here. You, I can't locate object method first. First of all, first is a function here. It's a function. It's not an object method. It's a function. But it says I, this is a, it's an object method. That's what I think it is. And I can't find it. I did look for it in the package zero where I think it should be. So Perl thinks that there's a class zero, which has a method called first. And then it says, I can't find the package zero, or at least I tried to access it and go for first, but no. And then it suggests something very helpful. Maybe I need to use zero, the module zero, which does not exist. I can't run use zero. Uh, it's kind of weird. What we're getting here is that Perl thought I meant something else. And it gave me the error of this other thing. And unless you know that is the, what the other thing is and why it misunderstood it as the other thing, you will not be able to fix it because there's no way for you to fix this error. The only way for you is to fix the code that Perl misunderstood as a different type of code that had this error. Once in a while, we encounter this at work and it could take between 10 minutes and several days to fix. This was the error. That's it. See, Perl has prototypes. Prototypes allow the developer of a subroutine or function to indicate how the function should be parsed by the Perl parser. It's very cool. Also very bad, but it is very cool. And if that doesn't exist, when Perl hits first, it doesn't know what's going to happen. Now, I want to go back for a moment. We use these prototypes because we think they're really cool because yeah, they are. But if you look at this, even though it looks really cool to a new person coming to a newcomer to Perl, this is actually very confusing because first doesn't have parentheses, which are used for functions. It doesn't have it. It also doesn't have the keyword sub, which is used for a callback. So this looks like a bear block or this looks like maybe a hash ref. So it's not really clear what that is. And then there's no comma between arguments there. So who has the argument on what? Because the only way for Perl to parse this is if you tell it to parse it, it actually just tried to parse it as something else, which was an object method first on a package zero. All right, well, that's, that's an example of a technical debt that you have to deal with as a developer. Nowadays, you can finally do no indirect thanks to Tony Cook, but really this is very annoying. This is something that I also like specifically because what happens here is I try to use something really cool and I get no errors and warnings and something entirely different happens. I have an array foo bar. 
I'm trying to access two values at the same time, which is something you could do in Perl. I use it a lot. It is incredibly useful. So I'm accessing hash foobar. And then I'm, getting, I'm setting one to val1, uh, the other one to val2. They are both undefined. Even though I see them, one and two, and they're undefined. This is even harder to debug. I'm going to, for those guessing, usually when we're all together physically, I'll get people to, to raise their hand. You could try to raise your hand. I won't see it, but go ahead and raise your hand if you know what the problem is. Congratulations. If you figured out, it is one single character. See, when this is a dollar sign, the sigil there, Pro understands that you're trying to access one key, even though I gave two keys. Now, when I give two keys, but I only ask for one, what Pro understands is that I'm trying the multidimensional syntax. If you don't know what the multidimensional syntax is, well, you shouldn't. It's not something you want to use. What it will actually do is take both of those keys, mix them together using a variable that you don't even know about, and then try to access that as a single key. That's why this would work. That's why you also won't get an error or a warning. It will work. Perl says, yes, this is some different syntax, and I'm sure this is what you wanted to write. Really? This is what I wanted to write? So, no, in fact, what I wanted to write was this. Give me two. Give me the values for key foo and the value for key bar. Ah. All right, so now you can do no multidimensional, but this is on CPAM. There's also bare word file handle on CPM. There's like a bunch of these things. We had a core developer summit where we tried to write down all the things that we enable that to us is like a good baseline for Perl. That list I think was around eight to 10 lines. Imagine that every single time just to get to the right baseline. But that is the cost that you have to pay as developers who continue to develop, who are willing to update a piece of code, but you still have to do this. And all of the, I mean, all of these should have been removed, but they haven't. There's a bunch of things under syntax, under uh, feature. So if you use use feature, you can use a bunch of these. There are also a bunch of these uh, programs that you can enable and disable. So syntax features have to uh, be enabled uh, using uh, use feature. They have to be enabled using use experimental if they're experimental features. And otherwise, and this is kind of a, a problem. I looked this up. If you are not enabling anything, you're using the syntax of 2002. So when you start a Perl program, I, my my view of the best Perl program, the best beginning stanza of a Perl program is nothing. It is empty. You open the file. That's the best Perl you have. But no, you don't have this. Instead, you're starting 2002, and then you have to tack on top of it stuff that is new, which is very grim statement for me to make. Really, when you're picking up the latest Perl, Saturday, I'm looking behind me because Saturday was behind me. And Saturday, we released 532. We've been working on this for a year, 13 months, actually. But you still move back 18 years in syntax, right? How can we? Okay. All right. This works because we introduce features with feature guards. Now, I want to explain how feature guards work. Feature guards are these things, use feature, use experimental, use V, like use V510, use V532. They enable these things. Use feature, enable specific features. Use experimental, enables the features if they're experimental without a warning. And use V5 whatever would turn on all of the ones that arrived at that version and make sure this is the minimum version. Feature guards are very interesting. They guard the syntax. The idea is that it would never change unless you request it, which is a really good idea because it defends against undesired syntax and semantics. So if you think about um, Python 3, Python 3 introduced Unicode semantics and suddenly all the code was not bytes, it was suddenly Unicode characters. And we could do the same. We have Unicode string. You could do use feature Unicode strings, but then you have to account for it everywhere, which means the semantics changed and maybe you didn't want that. So that's, that's feature guards help you against that. That's really good. And it's fairly unique. I couldn't find many programming languages that have any concept like this, but ECMAScript 5, which is the JavaScript standard, 
they actually added you strict. And I'm not just quoting there, it is added with a string. It's added as a string. The idea is that it's a void statement as a string. It does nothing, it doesn't store anywhere. And if you're using EC5, ES5, it will understand it, turn on strict. They literally took use strict from Perl. But if you're using an older version, it would just see a string and everything would be fine. For what it's worth, if you do this in Perl, you put something just as a string without actually doing something with it, Perl will warn you and tell you you're doing this thing, but it has zero effect on your program. You probably didn't want to do this, but you know, JavaScript, it's fine. And you might be thinking, yeah, this is great. So we can do th things this way. It's great, except default for everything. It didn't keep it as you have to enable it. All modules in ES6 automatically have used strict. So they're kind of using it, but they're also showing us something. And I think it's very important to learn a few lessons from others. What I would like to say is that feature guards, although being really awesome, they actually have issues if you had not noticed them yet. The problem, first one, major problem, is that they are tribal knowledge, whether we like it or not. See, the thing you have to know about them, not everyone does. I was writing that slide and I was looking at P5P and IRC and I found this quote by Bram who allowed me, um, gave me permission to share it with you. He wrote, indeed, I wasn't really aware of underscores sub underscores until now. It was introduced in 5.16. Now underscores sub underscores is a great feature which is used for providing the current subroutine pointer. So if you're doing a lot of functional programming, this is incredibly useful. You have to enable with use feature current sub. Now you might be thinking, okay, this is this is probably a new thing, right? It's 5.16. No, 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 no. 5.16 came out eight years ago. Eight. This is not new. Now, the next thing you're gonna say is, well, of course, maybe Bram is an outsider. You know, Bram only started with Pro and he joined, you know, the channel and he just went like, wow, this is crazy. I don't even know about this. No, Bram is actually a consistent person on P5P. Also, this isn't Pro Help, Pro Newbie, it's not any of those things. This is P5P, this is the porters. This is the chat in which we discuss the implementation detail of these things. There is no more inner circle of knowledge, obviously open to everyone, but most people don't go. So th there is no more technical inner knowledge than going on P5P and this person still didn't know about it. So what does that tell you? These are not random people who don't know about this. These are not beginners who don't know about this. This is us not knowing about this. Raise your hand if you didn't know about current sub. Don't worry, I'm not even looking, I won't see it, but I mean, let's be honest. So it's a problem. They are tribal knowledge. And it's hard to say, but it's a fact. We write features in order to use them, right? Like that's why we write them. We think they're gonna be helpful. So we want them to be used. But, they, but they, these feature guards brought this wall that somehow makes sure they won't be used. And I think another major problem to this is that they really are forever. They're not gonna, you know, go away. Okay, well, so how do we really change this prioritization? We, we want features to be used. What do we change in order to make sure they're used? All right, let's talk about roadmaps. And hopefully by the end of this, we'll get to how we change. I love the sentence, plan your work, work your plan. And we need, we need a roadmap, but here's, here's the thing. You might've been using Perl for a very long time and you would be thinking, yeah, Perl did have a roadmap. Larry worked on Perl, he produced multiple versions of it. In his head, he was thinking, these are the things I wanna introduce. These are the things I'm gonna tackle. He's an amazing developer and also had numerous users. So people gave a lot of ideas and eventually it formed, right? We also had these changes. We had Perl 1 in 87. The next year we had Perl 2, then the next year we had Perl 3. It was, let's say a new version, even though it was just a rename for a book, let's ignore that for a moment. That's, uh, that was uh, two years later. And then three years later we had Perl 5. So this, this was a roadmap um, and, and things were introduced in each version except for. So this is what we expected to happen. We, we assumed, okay, we're gonna have um, this, this nice one, two, three, four, five, 
and then six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's what languages do. But something happened. Perl six happened. And I know it's an uncomfortable topic for a lot of people to talk about, but I think we do need to talk about Perl six. Now, Perl six had been renamed Raku, so I'm going to talk about Raku. Okay. When I want to evaluate Raku, I think Raku had two goals that changed. The first one was to be version six of Perl. Right? The second one was to be Raku. Version six of Perl would just be the next version. It would be different. It would be a lot of things would be new in it. It would be more capable. It would have more things, maybe some changes. And then Raku is a next generation language. It is enviable. It is strong. It is incredibly flexible, amazing. The grammar uh, capability is just, it, it's something else. But those are not the same, right? When we look at both of those goals, if we're thinking about the next version of Perl, that didn't pan out. The reason it didn't pan out is simply because it succeeded at being a different language that is similar to Perl. So I don't want to say that Raku failed. It didn't fail. It succeeded in doing something else because when they looked into it, they realized, you know, this what we really want is like this other thing that is very similar but really different. And it produced something incredible. It's, I am so amazed with what they've done. It really is. If you take a look at errors, for example, Raku provides errors that are very difficult to compare to other languages in, in how useful they are to the user. And in, in its capabilities in managing whether it's uh, numbers or whether it's strings or whether it's in, indefinite uh, or uh, infinite loops or just all of its asynchronous capability, it's just incredible. So that didn't pan out as version six of Pro. That didn't, that didn't happen. So this nice really laid out plan had to deal with the enemy and then it changed. Um, all laid out plans had to deal with the enemy. For, our, for us, I think the enemy was just time and scope. So what we ended up with was just Pro 5. And we got Raku for it, so that's not a bad deal, right? But we, we just had Pro 5 all over the plan. That's it, that's what we all had to deal with. And we released a lot of Pro 5s. We just went to 5, 10, 12, 14, 16, all of these all the way to 30. And just, yeah, right there behind me Saturday, we had 5.32. So we had these two roads. In version five, we said, okay, this is maintenance mode. We're gonna grow this, we're gonna create the next version. And, and the next version, the idea was, okay, languages grow, we need to evolve, we're going to change, um, and we're going to produce version six. What would go in version six? And then as we continued, we realized, no, 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 this doesn't fit as version six. We tried keeping the name, we tried kind of working that out, but eventually it's not, it's not version six, it's rock. It's a different thing. So what we ended up with is version five saying, well, we still need to grow and evolve. So now we have these two roads and Pro 5 is on both which uh, produced this really funny case. And, you know, we have a split personality. We want to evolve, we don't want to evolve. So what do we do? Okay, well, feature guards, that's that's a simple solution, right? That's, that's all we need to do, right? But, oh yeah, I forgot. With feature guards, we a situation where all the investments are making the default, the old thing, and then having to enable everything, and then eventually providing diminished usage uh, users the benefit of that, just having everything and then providing those that increase the usage, the worst experience we can imagine because they have to account for all that old stuff and we can't remove it. And it's just, yeah, okay. So maybe it seems like feature guards are the problem. I, I don't want to say it's a problem. I think the problem is that feature guards are permanent. I think we can fix it. So uh, this really is why all the feature guards are forever. They're permanent because every version of Perl is version five. And Perl 6 had the right idea. Version 6 needed to happen. We need to move forward. The thing is, we did move forward, but we didn't enable any of it. You put the onus of you moving forward on you. You have to make sure it moves forward. You have to turn on all of these years, uh, 18 years, you have to move us forward. So yeah, I would say I agree with the statement that Perl 5 must stay Perl 5. But I don't think Perl needs to stay Perl 5. And that means that we need a new major version. That's, that is what we need.
at this moment. Now, I know with this, this uh, probably in, over there on the other side of my uh, webcam, you have this uh-oh moment. Uh, this is going to be oh, 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 wow. And yeah, yeah, you're right. So this is our plan. This is what we're going to do. What we're going to do is we're going to jump from five to seven, right? Six was Raku. Turn out to be a different language. That's okay. We're going to make the leap from five to seven. We aren't the only language that did, that is going to do this. Uh, a bunch of other languages did this. Java jump versions. PHP specifically moved from five to seven. So, you know, uh, a lot of people make fun of PHP, but we have a lot to learn from them. And we can also move major versions similar to how they did it. Now, another core concept here that you might be seeing is that in one version, we could add new features. In another major version, we can finally enable new features. So I'm nearing the end of my talk. What does this really mean? Well, so Perl is no longer the maintenance by default. We're, we're leaving that idea behind. We need to reprioritize. First of all, feature guards are going to be bound to major versions, really what they are now. So in 7, it will have different feature guards. That really means that in major versions, we promote new defaults. So if we, for example, move to seven, uh, the change, so one of the changes we could do is add stricken warnings. That's just the new default. And the feature guards would be for a feature that we introduced in seven, 7.2, 7 7.4, that would use a feature guard. But then in eight, we could enable that. Additionally, and this is very, very important to the reprioritization idea, is that in major versions, we can finally remove syntax. So if we disable, for example, indirect syntax in 7, in 8, theoretically, we could remove indirect syntax. And I know there is one person there that is still writing indirect syntax and demands to never change it. But you know what? That's not our top priority, right? So we can finally have better error messages. We can finally introduce features without to drag behind this weight, right? Now, 7 specifically will be 532, but with a few new defaults. We're still discussing which. So I'm not going to say all of them. I'm going to say several of them. Some programs, some features. I will say strict warnings, but definitely not Unicode semantics. So we still need to figure out on the porters list and the core developers what we're going to do. But some will be enabled. Pro 5 itself, the major version of 5, will enter a long-term support period. We're working with distributions, we're working with um, OpenBSD, and we're working with Debian, and what we're trying to figure out is what is a good support window, what kind of support would they like, so we're, we are going to have to backport uh, several bug fixes, security for sure, for a very long time. We're discussing five plus years for sure, so definitely not you know the regular two years that we have. And we definitely are introducing several paths for you to upgrade. So you could move easily your code where you need to. And we're also going to introduce compatibility modes for modules. So you could upload Perl 7 code onto CPAN and there would be a compatibility module applied so you could actually also use it within a Perl 5 using the defaults of Perl 5. All right, now if we take a look at the cost benefit analysis, and this is what I really want you to focus on, the priorities, who are our most important users and how do we serve them best? With this change, the absentee might have a small cost, and that is to remove crafty old code that doesn't, it shouldn't work anymore if they decide to upgrade. That means that the experience is not that bad. For the maintainer and the novice, we're giving them a smaller cost. They might need once in a while to change something that was wrong, and that's okay but it's a very little cost. They don't have to start with the 10 lines of things to enable and disable and turn on and, and import. And they don't have to do that anymore. Their blank slate will be the best possible Perl that we could produce, which is what people want. When they pick up a language, they're saying, give me the language. And what we're saying is, we're going to give you half of it. You're going to have to enable the rest yourself. So not anymore, right? They're going to get the best one out of the box. They don't need to know about it, no tribal knowledge, no, none of that. So they're going to get the best experience so they could write new code or they could maintain the code that they have with new features. All right. So now you're probably worried, really worried. What about when things break? Because things will definitely break. The entire world is going to break. That's what we think, right? So, okay, there are ways to deal with it. First, you could correct your code. If your code doesn't work on, on use strict, well, you know what? 
time to join the century, time to start writing, you know, correct code. And we are going to try to provide some tooling for this. So if we're going to enable signatures, for example, in whatever major version, you're going to have to change your prototype to say colon prototype. And that is a simple tooling that we can introduce. Also, you could disable progmas, you could disable features. So if strict gives you warnings, you can still write no strict, you can still write no warnings. That's fine, that will continue to work. If you're using indirect syntax, you could say use indirect, that will continue to work. Now, we're also introducing compat modules and what they will do is disable or rather revert to that version all at once. So if you say use compat Pro 5, it's basically going to give you every default that Pro 5 had, 5.32 versus 7.0. And of course, you could always use an older version of Pro. You know, 5.10 is available, 5.16 is available, whatever you wanted to use. If you want to use that, you have to use that. That's still available. We're only talking about breakage for people who demand to update. And you know what? If you want to update, you should update. Not just the binary, also sometimes your code. So I'm going to try to present this case as a developer for the people who are the most concerned and that this might actually impact. If you have bad, bad patterns in your code and you refuse to update the bad patterns in your code and you refuse to update your code to know that you are using bad patterns knowingly and you refuse to turn on compatibility mode to Perl 5 and you demand that you or your distribution still update to Perl 7 for you, then you know what? You're not going to be happy, but and this is this is hard for me to say, but it, it, I think it requires a lot of honesty. That's okay. That that isn't our primary target, because that code is not going to grow. If we look at our users, for Naveen. They, yeah, definitely Naveen should use Perl because he gets the best experience out of the box, no tribal knowledge, no cargo call, no copy paste, better error messages and warnings, tooling, and automatically avoids all of the common pitfalls. For Marie, the maintainer, it's even easier. New features available in every major version. Minor versions still have the feature guard, so she could turn those on, use feature, and get all this nice features in a sneak preview improve tooling and experience, and it is rewarding to continuously use Perl. You don't have to work around things anymore. For Anna, the absentee, or people who use their stuff, you don't have to use Perl anymore, but some things might have to uh, change. You could apply patches. If Anna wrote stuff that is on a distribution, the distribution will update it for you. That's not a problem. But if you are using Anna's code directly, then you could apply the patches or you could bring Anna to apply the patches or hire someone to apply them. That's okay. New functionality can still be disabled manually. All the version of the Perl can still be installed and used. If you want to use Anna's code forever and never change it, install that version of Perl for that, use it. It's okay. We do that with other things. Perl should start joining the other languages in its scale. Now, what's the timeline? We intend to release 7.0.0 in under one year. That is the official timeline where we actually intend to do is try to get it out of the door in less than half a year. What capabilities will Perl 7 include? I'm sure you're wondering, I'm sure you really want to see like what are the new snazzy stuff? Nothing. You get no new capabilities. It's going to be exactly 532 except we're going to enable a few things. No new features. There's still plenty of work to do. We need to update all of the core code. We need to update the internal library code. We need to update the internal tooling. We need to review all of the agreements, what are we accounted for in different versions. And I want to overhaul the documentation, or at least have a plan for it, because the documentation really represents how we see the language, how we want it to be used. You're welcome to join the effort. There's the P5P mailing list. There is also GitHub. You can reach out to me and to other core developers. And I'd like to thank you very, very much for attending, for listening. I hope you're still there because I can't see you. And enjoy the rest of the conference. We have a few hands. Sorry, guys. Uh, Sawyer, can you hear me? Yes. We have a few questions. Do you, do you want, uh, are you uh, up for some questions? Sure. If we have the time, yeah, absolutely. I can't promise I'm going to answer them well or at all. Okay. We'll start, start, with. start with Curtis. I, this isn't a question, it's just a comment for uh, a number of other folks. This doesn't break anything in Perl. 
That's the main thing which I think a lot of the detractors are going to be concerned about. There is nothing in this which breaks anything in Perl. If you stay on Perl 5, you're fine. There is no issue there. It's if you decide to go to Perl 7, Perl 8, or beyond, and whatever you go, and you happen to write Perl that uh, is problematic, then yes, you might have some issues. If you want your code to continue running correctly, and you want to continue to running correctly under Perl 5, there's no issue, none. So just please keep that in mind. So no question, just a comment. Okay, Michael. Uh, actually, I didn't have a question. That was uh, oh, quite a while ago, so. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Salve. Hey, hey, can you hear me? We can. Awesome. Uh, hi, Sawyer. Um, just quickly, um, why not just jump to version 32 and then show the world that things have happened, this is where we are, we're still continuing, and uh, that's, it's just a higher number, basically. Yeah, so um, my answer to this is that uh, other than uh, thinking that 32 is a terrible number to jump to because it's just too big, um, I think it's also bringing more confusion into this. Seven particularly is not very important. Really, what I'm looking for is Perl 8, to be honest. So um, the, the goal is to just start with a number. But I think that number still has to make sense. And I think dropping the 32 is still the whole issue of version 5, because we're still keeping, you know, it's it's Pro 5, so we're going to drop the, the 5, we're going to keep the 32. But the idea is that 5 was never, never meant to stay 5 forever. It meant to go to 6. And we have Raku, that's great. But that means that, okay, not 6, so it's just move, move on to the next one. And I think it's very important to um, disassociate the version number from the previous version numbers that we were talking about, like 5 and 6. So I think 32 is just too big of a jump and it's harder to follow 32, 34, 35. It's easier to follow seven, eight, nine, and uh, eventually uh, developers willing will reach 32. Okay, uh, next we have Mike. Hello. Um, so one of the questions that I saw in chat um, was related to uh, named uh, named arguments and func and function and subroutine signatures. Um, I know that right now that still yields uh, an experimental warning, and I'm wondering if the plan for Perl seven involves taking those things that have uh, so far been considered experimental and bringing those into Perl seven with us, or if we're just talking about the stuff that's not throwing an experimental warning right now in our first foray into Perl uh, into Perl seven. Um, and then I'm wondering, um, within each major version uh, number of Perl 7, uh, is it like, are we going to have Perl 7 and then anything that happens up to that point is going to be a feature guard. And then on version eight, we remove all the feature guards and then keep on, right? Like, is, is it gonna be ratcheting up like that? Right, so uh, it's easier for me to answer the second question first. Um, yes, the goal is that uh, we move to seven and then you'll get, uh, everything will come into play. So let's say the 533 one, uh, which we should have had now, we're gonna have as, as uh, 7.1, right? And what it would have been uh, 534 is actually gonna be 7.2. So uh, the goal is for everything that comes in within the major version, you would have to use use feature because the major version should not ever introduced syntax that you didn't request. But the idea is that if we wrote this feature, we want you to use it and we think you should. So in eight, it will be enabled by default. Having said that, there are a set of existing features which we cannot wholesale enable. We just can't, it would be disastrous. It will be worse than Python 3 and the difficulty that they've had with this. So we're gonna have to be very judicious to either remove keep guarded forever, or slowly introduce things that currently exist. But for all of the new stuff, the goal is to write it, so it will be used and it will be by default enabled in the next major version. 
As for signature specifically, um, there are a few perspectives here I'm going to share too. The first one is the person who's writing the signature implementation is Dave Mitchell, who is amazing. He's incredible. And Dave has a lot of plans for signatures. And they're really, really spectacular. And the reason that this was um, experimental is just because of that. Now, moving it to uh, 7.2 um, or, or 7 even, uh, 7.0, sorry, moving it to 7.0, that will depend heavily on what else is planned for it because we might need to keep it experimental. On the other hand, my goal is actually to put in 7.0 because I am actually looking forward for 7.2, 7.4, 7.6, one of those to introduce the core PM that uh, Ovid uh, Curtis Poe has been working on. And if we're able to do that, that means that at 8.0, you will have a very capable, strong object-oriented syntax out of the box. So you'd have something better than Moose that draws a lot from Moose, right? But better than that in core in 8.0. But to do that, we would have to bring in signatures unless we're bringing both signatures and core PM in 8.0. So still not sure about that. Okay, and uh, we have a lot of hands up, uh, but unfortunately we have sessions that are going to be starting in about five minutes. Uh, Sawyer, would you be up for attending a Birds of Feather uh, later today or tomorrow morning? What works best for you? Uh, tomorrow morning is good for, I think tomorrow morning will give us more time and I would be more lucid. Uh, I don't know when, when would tonight be? So how about we stay in touch a little bit um, just right after and see when tonight is? Uh, I think the- okay. And, and just like I told others, uh, go to CIC Hallway and, and we can uh, make a plan there. Uh, you guys can do that together. Well, thank you very much for speaking. Uh, we guys, we will see you guys in the next sessions. The, uh, each session will end and then you can go into SCED and get the link for the next session. Everybody should have the password that's in Zoom already. It's the same as you've already used. Okay, we'll see you soon. Thank you for joining us.